Joshua, I've heard that people said that you were either drunk or on drugs when you decided to launch a print magazine. What do you say to people like that? <laughs> it's absolutely true. No, neither of those are true yet. Um, but it has been an interesting journey and it's certainly been very counterintuitive to what most people would think. But that's kind of how I roll. So yeah, I guess um, if I go back about nine years though first, I, um, I wrote a book called Happiness Is and I knew nothing about publishing at the time. The extent of my publishing knowledge was a uh, one day self-publishing workshop and a one day publishing workshop and uh, and I thought well of course I've got the business acumen to go ahead with this and uh, and that book was quite successful I sold 36,000 copies in the first 12 months and um, primarily pre-sold to corporates and kind of changed the whole model and looked at publishing in a very different way fast forward nine years and I've now done I think authored and co-authored 17 books and uh, for someone who did veggie English at school it's not too bad <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, and then I just, um, I just thought, you know, surrounded by so many extraordinary people, I've now produced, I think, over 400 books for corporates and individuals, and was lucky enough to have these amazing entrepreneurs and inspirational people in my life every single day. And I looked at a lot of the traditional media, and it's kind of full of vacuous content and salacious gossip, and quite frankly, I was sick to death of it. And books for me were quite one-dimensional in terms of you know, you work with someone for four months to 12 months or whatever it is, and they're extraordinary. And I thought, imagine if I could actually combine all of this knowledge into one format. And, uh, and obviously, you know, print, print magazines are, are falling by the wayside on an almost daily basis globally at the moment. I mean, in the last 12 months in Australia alone, we've lost what BRW in the business space and Grazio and Madison and some pretty amazing titles. So it was a pretty ballsy move um, and and yeah it so far it's working though so I just wanted to do something a little different and it's it's been very strategic um, launching it as a print magazine so we can talk a bit more about that if you want. Well I was going to ask the uh, uh, a mate of mine talks about three types of customers, a serial entrepreneur called Sebastian Eckersley Maslin. Most mm -hmm. people focus on the first customer, yeah. which is the person who buys the product yeah. or is the consumer of the product. Yeah. The second is often the investor or the person who will be the exit strategy. Yeah. The third customer, which a lot of people overlook and forget about, is the strategic partner or reseller. Yeah. Now, that's been fundamental to your success, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think... Um you know, the success of the collective to date is very much around, you know, the power of leverage and our strategic alliances and partnerships. And I always say, um, you know, there's no way we could have done this without them. And so the power for me has always been in, you know, like-minded, non-competing companies who've got existing um, similar databases that we can tap into. And so that's very much been our strategy. And in fact, now I have two people who work full-time on that. That's their day job all day, every day, just finding strategic partnerships, both in Australia, and on a global scale. So yeah, it's, it's, um, I think it's the only way to run a business these days. Because your first partners were a bank? Yes. Anything else? Uh, that was pretty much it. <laughs> and that's a really interesting story actually about, you know, again, being counterintuitive. Most people, my whole um, methodology in business is fail fast. I think, you know, the majority of people that come to me wanting that quick fix or the guru thing or, you know, I just want to grab onto something and make the business work. For me, it's very much about back of the envelope stuff. Don't write me a hundred page laborious business plan and then, you know, put all your heart and soul and time and effort and energy into that but rather do something back in the envelope, go to potential partners. So I always um, create it and then work out how I'm going to actually do the thing. So yeah, so I did some back of the envelope stuff, went to Combank, stalked Andy Lark, who was the CMO at the time for about three months in every way possible. Finally, someone said to me, the guy's really big on social media sent him a tweet at 10 o'clock one night and said, hey, how about a coffee? He said, hey, how about two o'clock tomorrow? Walked in there with a several hundred thousand dollar um, proposal, shot the breeze for about 40 minutes and said, so what do you think of the, um, the collective? And he said, I've got no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> All these people had said to me that they'd given him this you know, two page proposal. And then I sold him on the concept um, and he fell in love with it and decided to back me then and there. And the thing is, it wouldn't have mattered on the monetary figure if it had been $20 or if it had been $200,000 or even $2 million, it doesn't matter because as soon as there's someone other than me that I'm accountable to, I had to go ahead. So yeah, but at the time I had, I had no idea what I was gonna do. It was you know, a figment of my imagination. I was selling vaporware. People say that entrepreneurs are risk takers, but there was, in, in your mind, there would have been no risk in that equation at all. 
Not really. I mean, no, and I think this is the problem. It's, I mean, I fail. People, you know, connote the word failure with, you know, it's a disaster, but I fail at least 20 times a day. It's just that I have a lot of ideas and I now, I'm extremely well networked so I can ping them off to a whole lot of different people and potential investors or corporates or whoever it happens to be and say what do you think of this and the thing for me is I'm never attached to outcome and I think that's the problem people put you know their whole life into one basket and then they beat themselves up when it suddenly all falls apart which it invariably will whereas with me it's kind of like okay bang knock that one on the head knock that one on the head change it morph it pivot iterate in another way and don't get attached to what the overall outcome is and I think that's a really really important lesson and you just got to be able to move and move quickly what would you have to say to, to those people that just seem I think I think the idea of launching is 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 too frightening because then they might fail. Mm. Whereas the benefit of dreaming is far is is far more alluring than the fear of failure. Yeah, I call them gunners. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that, and they never actually do it. And I think it's really it's really sad. I think fear of failure is equally as large as fear of success. And I think in fact fear of success overrides that a lot of the time. And I think, you know, it, it's just, I just say to people, just start. You know, a friend of mine said to me a few weeks ago, who's actually an extraordinary entrepreneur, he's had a lot of fantastic businesses and he's exited and he's in a bit of a, a lull. And so coming from him, I, I found it almost farcical because he said to me, Lisa, I don't know what I'm doing now. And I said to him, what's your passion? Like really simply, what's your passion? What do you want to do right now? And he said, well, I love food right now and I love travel. I said, where do you love travel? I love Bali. I said, right, would you be interested in running foodie tours to Bali? He goes, yeah. Like this is, that's how long the conversation was. I said, throw it up on social media, any platform of your choice, let's go for Facebook and just ask the question, who would be interested in doing a foodie tour to Bali? Like he did it. And I said, the thing is, that is as simple and as complex as any of my business plans get quite quite seriously and so he put that up as soon as one person says wow that sounds amazing send me more information that's when I would start to develop what I'm actually going to do. Do you think that this is one of the things that's empowered the self-help boom or the connotations that we have about success and entrepreneurship to do with overnight success is it because of this fear and people are looking for a hidden path or a special secret? Everyone wants a quick fix and I, I mean this is something you know perpetually and you'll get this as well I go and do a speaking gig and I might you know I try and give absolutely everything of myself authentically for an hour on stage and then people will you know come in droves afterwards and they'll want specific questions about their business and they'll want um, the quick fix and the pill at which point my energy completely evaporates and I just don't want to know and there's a complete block if they can meet me like really meet me and they feel like they're an equal and they want to have a, a proper robust business conversation around where they're going and I can see that they believe in themselves I will stand there and talk to them for the next 24 hours but if they want me to be their guru and their quick fix and their you know their savior I, I could not be less interested and energetically I'll shut down completely the thing is I only have my experience, you know, I can't, it's my journey and, you know, there's been a lot of battles and risks and therapy and all sorts of other things that I've gone through to get here. I can't answer that for them, it's their journey. What motivates you to do the thing that you do? Freedom and choice. Freedom and choice, it's as mm. simple as that, isn't it? Yeah. So why do you think that this concept of entrepreneurship has become synonymous with greed and wealth? I think possibly those people aren't yet awake and they're chasing the wrong thing and they're potentially living life according to other people's expectations or what societal norm or the construct or whatever else they're seeing out there and if they actually tap into what it is that's true for them it's probably not that at all. I would imagine that if it's wealth that they're chasing and their for goal why? is to get there quick yeah we've got a double whammy here haven't we? Yeah and and for why that's the question I mean it's really funny, I think about issue two of the collective, you know, it took off really in quite a big way, much more quickly than I imagined. And I started getting all these questions and people saying, that's awesome, when are you going to exit? And I was like, are you serious? Because so many people have in their brain, you know, if you did a sequential book on entrepreneurship, you'd be like, da, 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 and now exit. And that's what everyone always thinks the mm. end goal is. And, you know, of course, that's clever in a way. But for me, I literally sat for four years going, what is my purpose? What is my purpose? What is my purpose? Finally, it landed and resonated in such a, an extraordinary way in every single cell of my body. So, even, so I had said on issue two, even if someone offered me $10 million, at that point it was like four months mm. old, 
why would I exit? Then I'd be mm. sitting there with $10 million going again. What is my purpose? So I think, you know, people need, really need to get really clear about is this just about the destination or is it actually about the journey? Cliche as that might sound, but for me it's very much around, you know, this is what I love doing. I love giving back. I love helping other people. I love showing, um, you know, putting myself as an example as an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs and saying that, you know, anything's possible. Do you have a specific ritual, ritual around learning? Every single year I do go overseas um, emphatically and make sure I attend a global conference of some sort because I think it's important to take myself out of this space. Um, it's funny though, the nature of what I've created with the magazine, each issue of which mm. we put it out once a month and you can relate to this, mm. we interview between 50 and 93 was our biggest issue people. And so I'm continuously learning because I'm continuously talking to extraordinary people and you know, and so that's quite a luxury in itself that I get to pick and choose which interviews I do who I get to meet. And the nice thing about having a magazine or you know any media outlet such as this as well, is that you know you get to spend time and hang out with the people that you kind of want to all over the globe. So so yeah, I guess uh, I guess I'm constantly learning and, and constantly pushing myself. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Lisa. And now if you want to learn more about what Lisa does, all you need to do is go to a news agent and that's right, get a copy of the collective.